Andrew covered a lot of territory, so I'm going to focus about how, uh, on how golf got started, but also what's the impetus behind its thinking, because in a way, it comes out of our experience with organizing within the Occupy movement as artists, uh, Occupy Wall Street, as well as strike debt, and using specific tactics and strategies, but that aren't just about direct action, but is in fact, um, working on the ground and movement-generated theory and acting upon that as artists, as cultural workers. Uh, the experience in Occupy was that a lot of us were cultural workers. We were precarious workers that had time to do stuff and had creativity to communicate messages and be effective of all the different ways that we can actually let um, you know, strike blows at the system, open up space for other people, engage, uh, and, and facilitate a self-organizing space. So one of the key factors that we brought into the campaign was organizing. So, and this is different from what people would understand the Yes Men is doing, because they would do tactical teams of two or three people, they would intervene, this would create some kind of like uh, media coverage or some kind of space. What we were talking about is how can we involve tens, twenties, thirties, forty, a hundred people, two hundred people and choose strategic targets that effectively we could not just uh, do symbolic actions but actions that would lend, uh, that would cause material damage and thinking about Gulf in that light is very instructive. The second thing is that in our debt analysis, before we learned a lesson from organizing around debt, which is not everyone has the same understanding of what debt means, right? Debt in a narrow sense means financial debt. But in a broader sense, it is bonds that hold us together and they could be negative and they could be positive and we all owe debts to each other, whether they're familial or societal, whether they're generational, uh, and whether they're based on race, right? So there's a debt owed in, for the Native Americans in the United States. There's a debt owed to African Americans who were slaves in the United States. Those are also debts. And thinking about what does, how can debt be a basis of solidarity? Of, and what does that look like? And in a way, what we're most familiar with is the debts that we owe to banks those debts that are individualizing, those debts that add to our alienation, those debts that are forms of social control, those debts that Hart and Negri talk about is the emergence of the indebted as one of the subjectivities. However, when we tried to organize within Occupy Wall Street, when we lost the park and tried to organize uh, around debt, we realized that people's understanding around debt is very neoliberal in itself, right? So education is a private debt. Housing uh, mortgage is a private debt. These debts, everyone wants to not pay them off, right? But they're also not willing to recognize the debts that they do owe, and those debts that could form a basis for people power. Within that understanding, we figured one of the ways in which we can work in Gulf, which is cross-class, so there is a challenge, and, and uh, transnational there's a transnational. So how can we think of debt in a transnational sense? And how can we think of debt in a cross-class sense? And how can we be mindful of race? Which if you look at the people that were on this picture, right, there were, there were brown. These are brown people, right, that are also employed by Arabs, but also have a colonial history, right? So what are the debts are we thinking about in that context? and what are the climate debts that would emerge. So definitely opening up that space and saying to the people that we're involving in this campaign, that we need to think, we need to make sure that we're asking the right questions that could lead to better questions. And this pamphlet that we distributed was present in our first meeting that we called for. That included students from NYU, so they're directly implicated in what's happening in the in the, on the island in which the museum is being built. 
We involved uh, artists who are actually, the Guggenheim would be part of their community, so there's something there. Art students who are actually uh, being uh, graduated with immense amounts of debt. Right, and, and what are these, what, are, what kind of coalition can emerge out of that? Not a coalition in which we need to hold, help, you know, help the, the poor brown worker who's building this like high class thing for some luxury 1% people, right? But almost what kind of coalition can emerge of equals that, that is not about, it's about helping ourselves and helping them in the process help themselves. And that's, that's not uh, that we knew the answer coming together, but that that was the start of the type of work that we're doing. So when we think about Gulf, we think more about what kind of coalition are we building, and obviously the most spectacular are the actions. Those are what get reported, those are whatever. But from our sense, this project is about finding ways to build power and trying to establish, uh, to lend blows at these institutions that, uh, that put us in a difficult position financially and in, in life, and also build our relationships one another, with one another. How am I doing on time? Because I don't want to. that five minutes. So. Okay, so, I, so that's kind of the basis. So I want to just kind of reiterate the fact that when we think about debt, we think of it in an expansive set, sense. When we launched this campaign, it started with no debt is an island, as a way to bring people together in a room that then continued into four meetings that resulted in, an, in kind of a consensus around inaction, but that it was a strategic move. We said we're not gonna limit the campaign to what's happening in Abu Dhabi. We know that the person in charge and where we could lend a material blow is in New York. So we took the battle to them in New York and they tried to claim it wasn't fair and we tried to say of course it's fair. You're Guggenheim, you just sold your name, right, to, to Abu Dhabi as a franchise. You could control what happens, right? So that was, that was something that we did. And then the second thing that we said is that we're gonna come up with another name. Because this isn't about all of us being unified in the same tactics, or trying to agree that we're all in the same position, but trying to create new spaces of resistance, new spaces of imagination, and that we, so that this effort can multiply and flourish and we can learn from all the different ways and, and not be afraid of failure, potentially, right? And I think that's, that's something that in the context of Occupy, there are successes and failures. In the context of Strike Debt, there are successes and we experience failures. But that's continuing on with this campaign of like, let's take on cross-class, let's be, let's be aware of race, and let's, let's fight from where we're at, which is New York. And this is the other aspect of privilege. We understand in New York that there's an immense amount of privilege. The same actions that we do in New York, if we did them here, they may not get the same coverage. We know this. This is an added responsibility on us in New York, right? And so when, when, when we're here, in Venice, this is the space that we need to be, right? And this is the type of coalition that we need to build. And we need to go back to New York and we need to figure out how we can be more effective. Because the borders that exist are not the borders that can lend us power. They're the, por they're the borders that, that stop us. This is in fact what Gulf is doing for me, right? I don't think of it in terms of art, although I, am an, I would say I am an artist. And I don't consider them in terms of an activist, although I do activist work. And I think these identities are something that we should be comfortable with. Everyone wants to categorize us, but in the context of the work that we do, I frankly don't give a shit, right? Um, and I'll leave it at that. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I will just quickly go over some of the actions that we've done as golf. Um, as I mean already mentioned, that the different spectrums of organizing that are important to us and that on one end of the uh, spectrum are artists, uh, precarious artists, NYU students, um, intellectuals in New York, and the other spectrum is actually workers who are of course in debt bondage and don't get paid a living wage and go into recruitment fees, um, debt in, uh, for recruitment fees, but they're also striking and resisting every day, right? So that is something that doesn't really come out that much in the media, so to understand that it's not just um, uh, like you said, they like go help the workers, but also amplifying voices and also to understand that um, workers are already striking. And I think 
Well, the research trips that we do are actually really important for building this coalition because it's a kind of a cycle. So when we go back, we actually talk about the actions that we have done and if they've heard about them or like, you know, how can we kind of start this loop of organizing within that. And um, in this loop, addition to this is also the sending side of the countries. Uh, which is some of the organizing that we're doing now, specifically in India. There's a bunch of, uh, there's a group called Society for Labor and Development. They're trying to think of how to actually push the governments from the sending side of the countries um, uh, to actually start some policies which um, uh, hold recruiters accountable. Because that is something that has been a big critique within the campaign as well. Is like, go ask the sending side of the countries. They're the ministers, they're the ones who are corrupt, versus uh, the Gulf countries or Guggenheim in itself. So, um, so I would just, uh, you know, divide up some of the things that we've done within the campaign or uh, the actions as four different categories. One is organizing, which Amin's talked about. The other is tactics. The third being media, and the fourth being aesthetics. Um, so within organizing, like we said, we try to organize a space which is also reflective of the analysis they've been working on. Um, so I wouldn't talk more about that. In terms of tactics, we've tried to occupy Guggenheim um, in different ways. And we've, uh, we've kind of done it in two different phases. Way. This way, okay. Um, I'm trying to look for the first action image. Okay. Uh, we've, try, we've tried to do, uh, we've done it in two different phases. Uh, the first phase kind of began on 22nd February last year, 2014. And we're right now in the second phase. Uh, and you know, the media action that we did is kind of uh, stepping off of that. So the first action was actually very simple. Um, you know, and this is also like, you know, how we learn. If from every action we learn and then we try to escalate from there. Um, if you know the space within the Guggenheim, it's actually a spiral, right? So the picture that was there before, and it kind of is reflective inside. So you have eight different floors. Uh, the way voice travels between these different flows is kind of really crucial to us. And uh, we think about all of these things as we are organizing. So the first action was just straight up going into the Guggenheim, throwing banners, and just you know reading a collective manifesto from five different levels, talking about what is the future of art. And in terms of aesthetics, it was important that we connected it to the exhibition that was going on at that time, which was actually Italian futurism. Right, so we were talking about like, is this the future of art? And you know, the manifesto was kind of like, who's building Guggenheim Abu Dhabi? Migrant workers in 50 degrees of heat, migrant workers resisting every day, migrant workers in dead bondage, and is this the future of art? So kind of, there was a manifesto with that. The second action that we did uh, related to that was actually occupying its facade, which was just, you know, kind of uh, making, you know, visualizing the 1% global museum, which is going to Helsinki, which is going to Abu Dhabi, and is, you know, is kind of the chain that uh, Marcos was talking about earlier. And is here in Venice as well, right? Um, and it's, I mean, I think if you think about museums specifically, Guggenheim is uh, kind of, um, the kind of pioneer in establishing its global outposts everywhere. Um, I heard they want to do one in Mexico soon, so I don't know how that goes. But um, um, and then the third action was uh, kind of taking um, uh, our cue from Abby Hoffman, who went in to the New York Stock Exchange and threw dollar bills, right, as a critique uh, of uh, New York Stock Exchange. And we um, designed a dollar bill similar to that, and just threw ten thousand of those uh, from the top of the Guggenheim. So this was like occupying the space visually in a different way. And this one, I think, um, another tactic that we've also thought about is actually them paying a material price. So these were actually stickers that we made and uh, went and pasted them on the walls of the museum, too close to the artwork, right? And so from like internal resources, we also heard that they actually had to answer their investors about like wh what is the security of the museum if artists can come in and uh, do anything and post stickers and you know um, do actions as they like. Um, and so this one is, and so all the actions that I just showed, they were the first phase of our organizing. And this is kind of the second phase. And I think it's also more, most important right now is because as Andrew mentioned earlier, we've had five years of inaction. Uh, we haven't gotten a concrete response from Guggenheim. Um, there are no plans of action play in place right now. And this is when we're actually crystallizing it to three basic demands and asking Guggenheim to kind of, uh, you know, fulfill those before they begin construction. And actually right now is the time when they're also going to um, uh, get their contractor uh, assigned and uh, the construction is going to, on the actual building is going to begin, begin this year. So the three demands that we're asking for is li a living wage. So uh, most of the workers actually just get paid $250 basic salary, around that much, for the Louvre that is getting constructed right now. And uh, from our research, we know that most of the workers actually demand $500 approximately. Um, the second is um, debt jubilee, right? So none of the workers should actually go into recruitment debt 
to be building the museum, which is, ranges from around $1,500 to $2,000. And the third one is right to organize, which is something which is important because workers have been organizing and they often get reported uh, for any action that they take. So, you know, this is kind of like the second phase that we're working on and, you know, Venice is also part of that. Um, and in, in, in this particular case, the aesthetics um, that we've used is on Kawara, and that was the kind of solo show that was happening. It just ended yesterday, I think, uh, which was um, on Kawara. He basically makes these paintings of dates um, as he goes to different places, and the behind of these paintings are either newspapers or just general images. And so we had uh, May Day translated in different languages, and we did the occupation on May Day and held space for the entire day and shut down the museum, uh, demanding to actually talk to the Board of Trustees. So this is like the most recent um, phase that we are in. Um, and that's car box. <laughs> um, and then the last thing I would say is, uh, how does media play into this? So, and, and as Amin mentioned, uh, you know, we, we have the privilege of being in New York and Guggenheim, New York being very, you know, uh, being the central kind of outpost to that. Uh, we always have media that is embedded in our actions, be it New York Times, be it Hyperallergic, which is kind of like our go-to place in, within the art world. And, and to think of our actions as like, you know, these media-based strategies and also to think of how do we hack their own PR system. Um, you know, they've had to officially hire somebody now who, who totally manages their PR ever since we uh, started these actions. So that, I've, I mean, I think those are the four categories that um, I would broadly work on. I think that's it. Is there anything else?